Welcome to the Bleep Midlife Bulimia Podcast with guest Christina Castagnini, licensed psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist. Hi everyone, I'm Lorianne, I'm the host of Bleep Midlife Bulimia, and I'm very pleased today to have Christina Castagnini, and she is a licensed psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So my first question is going to be, how did you get into the field of being a specialized eating disorder specialist? Uh, well, I actually didn't want to be, so it just kind of happened. Um, I actually had an eating disorder for years, and so uh, I knew I wanted to be a psychologist, and I thought, you know, there's this rumor that goes around in our field that we're all wounded warriors and we kind of all bring our own stuff into the room. And I was very adamant that I did not want to, you know, perpetuate that myth and bring my own stuff into the room. So I didn't want to touch eating disorders with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> no, I'm going to do something else. Um, and I actually have my master's degree in uh, marriage and family therapy. So I really just wanted to see couples and, and families. Um, but what ended up happening was I was doing intakes with patients and I started asking them questions about things. And I started to notice that the more I asked them certain questions, it really got to food and body image. And they started to open up about things they hadn't before with anybody. And it just got to the point where they, oh, wow, like nobody's ever gotten me. And there was just so much they actually didn't need to say. And it was just in that, that there was a real connection with so many people. And I think that is when I realized I never had that therapist when I was in treatment. I never had that person that I felt like, oh, you totally get me. Like, I never really had that trust. And so uh, over time, I just fell into it and uh, went and got into my certification and here I am years and years later and I love it so that's really interesting because we've talked about a lot of things but even the relationship part of uh of being in that relationship whether it's the person I mean just quickly I was of course as you know I struggled for 30 years and during that period I was married for 15 of them and he knew before we got married that I was bulimic but he never like, it was just like it, you know, even when I asked him if he wanted to come for help with me, it was like, no, I, I really don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of swept under the rug. But the problem is, is that that I'm pretty sure that that also caused some, you know, rifts in our marriage because of the way I was, because I was bulimic. So. Well, right, rightfully so. I think that's, you really need the support of people around you and to feel understood and there's so much secrecy, right? You're holding on to so much. And I don't know how you felt, but just to have that huge part of your life that's consuming your every day kept from the people that are so important to you, it's just so hard to get better. So I don't know if maybe that was what you were experiencing, but I find that is so hard. Yeah, I think it's easier if you do have that support. And, uh, and yet there's a lot of people that I've spoken to and their spouses also know about their eating disorder. Mm -hmm. They really don't know how to, how to handle that. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important for them to, uh, to get the help. And it's great. And like you said, the people go to you who are struggling with an eating disorder, you can relate to them. And I think that's really important. Yeah. So. Right, just to have that understanding of the struggle and, you know, the, the consuming nature of it all, right? It just, it consumes your mind, it consumes all your behaviors, and for people who don't have one, it, it does seem almost like you don't understand, and thank goodness people who don't have them don't understand it, because it is it's so toxic, and it's you, you suffer so much, and... You know, I think that's the hard part in, in having a support person come in, maybe into the therapy and try to understand a little bit, like how much of a struggle it is, because for everyone else who doesn't have one, it's like, what do you mean you can't just eat or you can't just not eat or, you know, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense and they don't really. And uh, I, I don't know how it was for you and your husband, but going out to eat, right? Like, it's very hard. 
and that's a big part of a relationship, right? Um, and to have that understanding and that partner that's like, okay, I know this is going to be hard for you to go to holidays or out to eat or make dinner together or just to be able to be like, okay, what do you need right now? Or to have that support person be like, okay, Christmas is going to be hard or birthday party is going to be hard or this wedding or, you know, it's like, ah, it's a lot. Yeah, and when you do that on your own, it's a little harder even yet, but uh, you're right. So what would you say, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a lot of the people that came to you when you were first starting in that, it was about, you know, body image, self-confidence. What do you find is the biggest, uh, I know there's a lot of, of challenges that, you know, people with eating disorders have, but would you pinpoint any top ones that they struggle with? I think COVID was a very interesting time, or it is an interesting time right now. I think because we weren't around a lot of other people, the majority of the people we've been looking at are on social media. And so the images that are out there right now are filtered, they're altered, they're fake, they're not real. And so the idealistic body image that people have in their minds are, uh, interesting right so <laughs> what people think they should look like or need to look like um they're very they're not real and so uh now i'm hoping being exposed to more normal looking people again and being social and realizing like oh not everybody looks filtered altered photoshopped um the perspective will shift i'm hoping um that's a lot of the toxicity is what happened was a lot of people turned to food to cope during COVID. Um, and so there was an increase in, you know, eating disorders uh, people were trying to control their food. Um, there was, there was an increase in either people trying to really restrict and control what they ate, or there was a few, like I said, people turned to food to cope. So it went kind of both ways. But at the same time, like I said, there was this influx of spending a lot more time on social media. And so people were either trying to really, really look like something they couldn't. Um, so they either felt really bad or they felt like, no, I really need to look like this. And so their eating disorder got worse in terms of the restriction and over exercising or gosh, I'm a failure with what I did to myself. I'm feeling awful in these horrible terms that came out like quarantine 15 and <clears throat> all these horrible diets like intermittent fasting and all this stuff that's just like you know you just get droves and droves of it like on your feed because how the internet works right you touch on one thing and then you just get more and more and more of it you know so hours and hours of it um so i think in particular this time right now i'm seeing a real increase in eating disorder behaviors and negative body image and feeling like a failure and a lot of uh diet this mentality and a lot of confusion about well how do I eat anymore so that's what I'm seeing now I would think too there's a lot more stress and anxiety involved with that I would imagine the parents with their kids at home and having to juggle everything uh, that's added stress and I mean I know with me one of the things that used to trigger it was stress and anxiety because uh, I'd run to the comfort Right. And if you think about what that is, like, so you feel anxious, you feel stressed, it's like out of control, right? Like I was saying, and so that you can distract, you can just escape those intense emotions while you're eating. It does it for a while, right? It works. And so you learn that that's what works. Food works. So I'm going to go turn to food over and over and over again, because when you're overwhelmed, you're stressed, you don't have to think about it. It's like, oh, food's right there. And then it becomes this habitual behavior that you do over and over and over again and then you wonder like why can't I stop doing it well it's because it works and it's fast it's readily available it's always there right you're not going to sit back and think when you're completely stressed and overwhelmed well what else can I do <laughs> you're not going to when you know the food's right there in the cupboard or in the fridge and it's readily available and accessible you know, all that's rough, if, especially at the end of the day, if you're tired, it's like, oh, no, you're not going to sit there and think, oh, maybe I'll go on a walk or call a friend or, go, you know, sit in a bubble bath like that takes a lot of effort. Yeah. 
And it really doesn't, but it does in our minds, right? <laughs> the time, it, it's just the easier way to go. Like I said, and the comfort of it too, it's almost as if you just, well, of course it does create some, uh, some, I guess, relief in your mind. There's all those different terms that they use as well. Uh, and I agree with you, by the way, the quarantine 15, quarantine 20, um, so they're going, um, I was very lucky. I, I mean, that's one thing that I was so pleased about being recovered is that it didn't affect me at all. And, uh, I'm sure that that's how you want your clients to end up, right? Is that even if stress happens, that that is not where they turn to. Well, I'm so glad to hear that for you too. And I think that's one way people often ask me, like, how did you know you were recovered? And um, not just even with the quarantine 15, but when I started to hear people talk about dieting, it pissed me off. I was like, <laughs> oh, diets, oh, or like the thought of it just was like, never again. That sounds like torture, like, right? It's like, before when I was in my eating disorder, I'd hear people talk about diets and I'm like, oh, tell me about it. Or I'd feel like, oh, I need to be doing that. Or, you know, it's like, you know, I'd be, that was like, was like a moth to a flame. I was like, oh, diets, tell me like, what's the next one? I thought I, I need to find like the one that's finally going to work. Right. And I know, gosh, like I'm in recovery. because I'm like, that sounds like the worst thing on the planet that I would ever, ever do again. No way. Thank you. Bye. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to hear that for you too. I agree. I find, you know, diets were so hard. I mean, living the way I live now, it's so much easier. And I'm going, why did I do that to myself for 30 years? You're going ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I'm laughing about it now. It's, it wasn't funny at the time, but, uh, but it really, uh, it really does that. So I would imagine, again, with your clients, what you would be doing is, is you would di discourage them from any diets and do you help them with the nutrition aspect of it in regards to, um, and I, again, I'm into, if I want a hamburger, I'll have a hamburger. If I want a pizza, I'll have a pizza. What I guess is the nutrition aspect of it is being able to eat like you did, I guess, before to a certain degree. I mean, when I was a kid, I ate normal. I never even thought about it till I was 15 and someone put me on a diet. Then all of a sudden my whole life turned around. Um, and what I like to say is, well, I'm eating like I did when I was, you know, before 15, enjoying my food and not even thinking about it. Um, so is that how you move your clients forward? Do you have programs that go on? Just You know, I, exactly your point. It's like food. When you're in your eating disorder, all you think about is food, right? And really, I... I, I try to get people to thinking like you want to feel better emotionally and physically after you're done eating than before and emotionally meaning you're not feeling guilty but you're also not feeling deprived <laughs> so um to that point and so you also want to feel better physically and so if all you're eating is salad right or you know people have these categories of food like good food bad food healthy unhealthy it's like we've got to get rid of the categories because food is just food right so people get so afraid, like, oh, if you, you let me eat what I want, I'm just going to eat brownies or cookies all day. And it's like, no, you won't. Be you might initially, because if you've deprived yourself for years and years, you're like, oh, my gosh, food, right? But if you think about it, like, physically, you're going to feel pretty awful. Like, you can't just sustain that. You can't think. You're going to feel sluggish. You're going to feel tired, right? You're going to want a variety of foods. Because, um, you know, physically, right, you just you can't. It's just not going to happen. Um, but you also don't want to beat yourself up and feel like guilty. Like, what did I just do? But you don't want to feel deprived. You want to be able to enjoy your food and say, wow, I had this variety of foods. Because um, if all you're eating is in your mind salads and like the good foods people have in their minds, you're going to feel deprived. And that can lead to binging and that mentality of, oh, all I'm going to eat is cookies and brownies because I often, I don't know if you ever thought this too, but I hear people say, I can't have these foods in the house. I don't trust myself. If I have them, I'm going to eat it all. Um, and that mentality comes from those categories of good food, bad food, healthy food, unhealthy. I can't have this, that mentality. It's interesting too. So if you, you know, I help people start to identify their hunger signals and their satiety signals, because I find a lot of people don't know when they're actually hungry or not hungry. There's a difference between not no longer hungry and starting to get full. And I think a lot of people kind of don't know when that happens because we 
first of all, we eat very fast and it takes 20 minutes to get to that point. And so if you're eating a meal and ask yourself, like, do you eat most meals in 10 minutes? Are you really spacing it out, right? But if you, when people eat mindfully and pretty slow, the taste bud receptors can actually kind of like start closing off. And so to your point, like the first bites, like the most potent and tasty, right? But as you start to get less hungry, the food starts to taste less potent. And so you can notice your body starting to get less hungry, more toward the full, um, if, you, if you really are tasting your food. So exactly. Do you find uh, with your clients, is that a difficult thing for them to get to? Because that was one big thing that helped me with my recovery, definitely, was being able to know that point of saturation when I was full and stopping and not going for a second bowl of whatever. Uh, and knowing that, you know, yeah, you can go, but A, it's not going to taste as well good, and B, you're not going to feel as great afterwards and thinking about the, the future me if I did it. <laughs> so, uh, but do you find that your clients have difficulties after having had an eating disorder for a while to adjust to that? I, I do. I think that that's one of the harder parts is, well, I, much like I said before, people don't really want to be in their bodies. They want to escape. They want to kind of dissociate. They kind of want that comfort. And so with the food, it's if somebody's, say, emotionally eating or binge eating, they escape into the food from like being, you were talking about the anxiety or the stress or whatever's going on, right? And so there's a disconnect from the body in that way with the food. And so you can't be connected to your body and know when you're hungry or not hungry or full if you're disconnected. So reconnecting with your body to know the hunger signals takes some time. And much like restricting, you're not connected to your body if you're restricting because being in the state of starving, right, undernourished, that's a struggle. Like that's a physical state of struggling and that's discomfort right and so to be able to do that for days and months and years sometimes for the long haul you gotta kind of disconnect from your body because otherwise you just be in a lot of pain all the time and so to reconnect again and like really understand like hunger when you're hungry it's not starving and a lot of people think that starving is oh that's when I'm hungry but it's not. And so it takes quite a while to really understand the difference. And, and also a lot of people who've been restricting for a long time really do not like the feeling of being full or having food in their stomach. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, one more question to ask you, which I find is really interesting that some people have asked as well, is um, why is it that I can love my family so much not want to hurt them, yet I'm hurting myself. And by hurting myself, I know I'm hurting them. Well, I, I find a lot of people with eating disorders are people pleasers. And so they do take care of everyone else before themselves. And so there's this focus on, you know, saying yes to everybody else and worrying so much about what everyone else thinks about them. And, you know, there's this, if I say no, I feel guilty. And so it's almost to the point where it's like everyone else comes first. And when it comes to self-care for themselves, it's like out the window. It's like there's almost this guilt of putting themselves first or even thinking about what they need. Mm. So that's not even, I find it's just it's not even on the radar. So by doing that, they're also putting, ultimately they don't see themselves as important. Even if they know people love them, I, that might be even difficult for them to really truly feel how much people love them. Right, because there's this almost um, core belief that I find is like, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth taking care of. Like, I, I need to be needed and I need to take care of everyone else. And that's my role is taking care of everyone else first. It's too bad. That's... Uh... Almost, I don't even like that word, but they call it self-sabotage. But I will say that even looking back on a few things, and luckily they don't bother me anymore. I've forgiven myself for it, but I sat there going, wow, you know, like I really 
I, I was self-sabotaging, not just with my eating disorder, but in other ways that I was reacting to things because my mindset wasn't right based on all of that. It all sort of came under one umbrella, but uh, I sat there going, wow. And sometimes I look back at my younger self, I go, I'm sorry, but I'm okay now. Which is great, right? You go through this recovery process and you work on so many levels. It's not, I think a lot of people have this misperception that treatment is about just, just, that word just, right? Just eating again or just eating properly or just figuring out how to eat. And it's so much more than that. It has, it's about the food, but it's not about the food. It's about the underlying emotional state. It's about the pain. It's about the hurt. It's about so many things. It's about why you're eating that way you know it the eating just it's about the food but i think the food is the symptom of the problem really that's just the surface level that we're dealing with yeah i agree with that so as we're closing off just if you can just tell us a little bit about your podcast okay great um it's behind the bite and um and you get that just for actually what we were just talking about it's like what's really behind you know the, the food the bite um, and I started, really, I was at uh, a hospital, Kaiser, for 15 years, and I decided, <laughs> it was a big decision, I'm a single mom and have two kids, and I had all the <laughs> golden handcuffs there, and I said, you know what, I, I went into this field really to make a mark in the world, and I'm not getting any younger, so uh, I really wanted to reach more people and get more knowledge and awareness and hopefully prevention about eating disorders out there than I could behind those same four walls. So uh, I left and I said, well, if I'm going to leave, I'm going to try this and try to reach more people. Uh, hopefully that'll happen. Uh, and we just get on there. Uh, real life people who like yourself who uh, have had eating disorders or are currently struggling with them because I feel like when I was in mine, I didn't have that I didn't hear of people who had them so I really thought what I was doing was just a diet or I was just failing and so if I could even get one person to listen to somebody's story and go wow I'm doing that I might have an eating disorder or give somebody hope that they can get better that's that's the aim uh, and also break a lot of the myths out there about eating disorders because there's so much wrong information and so I have a mix I have people on there who are really struggling. And then I also have experts on there who are bringing the right information uh, out there and breaking the mess. So I've, I'm coming at it too. Like I shared my story, but I'm also a professional. So I, I bring the professional hat and then I bring my personal story. So that's the hybrid I have on there. Perfect. And I think it's important for, <clears throat> excuse me, for my listeners to know that, you know, I know that they, there's a few people who said, well, there's nothing out there. Yes, there, there is. I know that there's not a lot um, on the eating disorder uh, side of things. Uh, so please do listen to Behind the Bite uh, with Christina and uh, make sure that, uh, and, you know, know that you're not alone. And, and we're here also to, to take questions. How can they get a hold of you, Christina, if they need to? Uh, I have the website for the podcast, Behind the Bite Podcast. And I also have my private practice website, freedomtowellness.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here with me. Really appreciate it. Much. You're wonderful. Amazing, amazing work you're doing. And so to you. So, all right. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit me at bleepbulimia.com.